Hello, good morning, and welcome to Christ United Methodist Church. I'm Brian. I'm the pastor here at CUMC in Waynesboro, PA, and we are so excited about today because we have the chance to worship together of that great, glorious, amazing, awesome, living, and active God. And we're going to do that today in some amazing ways. The, the best part about today is that you've chosen to join us, and thank you for that. Now, some are joining us in person on campus here, while others are joining us from somewhere else through Facebook, YouTube, or our website. In both cases, I want you to be a fully engaged participant in today's worship, not some sort of spectator. So here are some things you can do to make sure that you stay engaged. The first is to say hello. Now, if you're in person, you've probably already been doing it. Keep doing it. Wave to somebody on the far side of the sanctuary and make sure you're saying hello to somebody you don't know. If you're joining us online, use the comment section of the stream to say hello, good morning, any of those kind of things. If you're in person, pull out your smartphone at any time and check in on social media. Let people know where you are and why you're here today. If you're joining us online, consider sharing our stream on your page as well so that other people can join us. I do want to make sure that I'm keeping everything that's in your hearts and minds, the things that are lifting you up and the things that are weighing you down in my prayers, not only this morning, but throughout the week. The best way for that to happen is for you to let me know about them. So tell me your joys and concerns. You can do it using the comment section of the stream, or you can send me a text, 570-351-1619. Now, something may happen today that leaves you with a question. Maybe something I say, maybe something I don't say, maybe something God says directly to you through the scripture or through the music or, or something, whatever it is, go ahead and ask that question. You can put it in the comment section or you can send me the text and I'll do my best to answer it when we get to that spot in the worship or as soon after the worship experience as I can. Now, if you're joining us from somewhere else, we do recommend you create some sort of a sacred space, candles across your Bible. I also encourage you to have a piece of paper and a pencil or a digital device to take notes with. Folks in person, you should be doing the same thing. Also, if you're joining us from somewhere other than here, we will be having communion today. So at some point, if you haven't already done so, just get your elements ready, a piece of bread and juice or cracker, wine, whatever. The calendar, there are things taking place, although it's summer, so maybe not quite as many as normal. We got a couple things going on this week. Uh, Tuesday at 12.30, the bookworms will be gathering at the Red Run, Red Run Park uh, in Washington Township. Thursday at 10, the crafters will be getting together. And Friday at 8.15 will be the men's Bible study. And if you're not part of one of those groups, we encourage you to join one of those groups. Also, Friday at 6.30, the finance team will be having a meeting. What else is going on today? Well, today the flowers are in honor of Bill and Pat Short, given by, uh, by their friends here at Christ UMC. Also, this afternoon, immediately following this morning's worship experience, will be our, our going away party for Bill and Pat, as they will soon be leaving us. If you didn't sign up, don't worry about it. If you're here, stay. I'm sure there'll be plenty of food for everyone. The photo directories, we had all those pictures taken and, and information uh, corrected and all that. The directories have been uh, put together and they've been sent to the printer. We should have them back. We're hoping to have them back. I should put it that way. By the 17th, two weeks from today, the uh, we are asking for a monetary donation towards the directory of eight to ten dollars per directory. The, the reason we ask for that and why is there a range? Well, we hate to see money prevent things from taking place, but we do ex order extras for future use uh, for new members and, and for the office to use and stuff like that. And if you're able to make a larger donation, you're able to help out those who can't afford to pay for them themselves. Hmm. Well, friends, 
that's all I have to say to you at this time. And we will begin our worship experience now. God is good, and all the time. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Our song of praise this morning is God of grace and God of glory. If you're at home, you don't need to stand. Just sing along with us anyway. But if you're here in person, and you feel comfortable doing so, please rise and let's join together in singing.
please be seated. Ooh, and children's time. <clears throat> well, we've got some older children in person, but I'm sure we've got some kids at home today, too. So good morning and welcome. Thanks for being with us today. So today, I'm going to ask you a question, and in person, older children can still answer. Have you ever cried? Yeah, have you ever cried? I bet the ones at home have, too, right? So even people that don't want to admit it, I'm pretty sure that everybody here has cried. And everybody watching, everybody's worshiping from elsewhere has also cried at some point. So the next question is, why do we cry? What are some reasons why we cry? Sad. Okay, finally, somebody said sad. Sad's one. Uh, I'm hearing things, but my ears aren't good. I'm one of the older children, too. Uh, sadness, because we're sad, because we're hurt, because we have pain, um, or because somebody did something to us in, in some way. I, one time that I cried, I broke my arm. That hurt. I cried. I cried. Uh, we're, for the next eight weeks, we're, we're going to be talking about uh, something that happened in the Bible. We're going to be talking about, you ready for this word? Okay, exodus. <laughs> That's a, that's a churchy word. It's a Bible word. It means, it, it basically means leaving uh, or exiting. Exodus, there we go. can make the connection there. Like an exit sign or an exiting, you're leaving someplace. Well, in the Exodus, a whole bunch of people left from where they were. Now, the story starts, one of the things that starts with it is the people were crying. The people were crying. And specifically, they were crying out to God. They were hurting, they were in pain, they were suffering because people weren't treating them nicely. They, they were treating them as slaves, meaning they couldn't decide for themselves what they wanted to do. They had to do what the other people told them to do. And they cut stones, they made stones, and they built buildings out of them. They didn't get paid for it, uh, and they just got treated poorly and even whipped and tortured. It was terrible. And so they cried, and they cried out. And, and we're told that God heard them. And God didn't just hear them, that God was moved to act because of it. And so that's what we're going to be talking about for the next few weeks. What happens and how God makes some amazing things happen in order for them to have that exodus for them to be able to leave from where they were and go someplace else. Now, this happened a long time ago, about 3,200 years ago, uh, and God heard then, but God also hears now. So whenever we cry now because we're sad, because we're in pain, because somebody treats us badly, God hears. And God doesn't just hear, but God is moved to action. But sometimes, sometimes that action involves us doing something for somebody. Uh -huh. So just as God hears us when we cry out, we need to be able to hear others when they cry out as well. So let's have a prayer about that. Dear God, thank you for loving us and for loving us so much that you do hear us when we cry. Help us to hear others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining me. Good morning. I'm going to be sharing with you this morning three different selections from the book of Exodus, basically chapters 1 and chapter 2. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase, and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramesses, for Pharaoh. 
the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shepheth and the other Puah, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. Now a man from the house of E I'm sorry, a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with pitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his words. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Those are the first words from that reading that Evangeline did such a wonderful job on too. Thank you, Evangeline. But those are the first words from that passage. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Th those words sound like useless information, and yet they're not. It's very important information. It tells us a lot. The author of this part of the story is giving us a whole lot of information without saying a whole lot of things. He just says, a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And in so doing, he's giving us some context 
context of time, we know where along a timeline this is taking place. It's obviously after the great famine. It's after Joseph and his brothers and his father and their family went to Egypt. It's after he provided a way and became so powerful in Egypt to keep people alive during that terrible famine. We're also given the location where we know that it must be taking place in Egypt. Why else would you mention that there's a king in Egypt? <laughs> and it's giving us a situation and telling us why the situation is what it is. Because this king has no memory of what took place. So at least a generation, if not two or three, has gone by since the time of Joseph. And all the people who lived because of Joseph's actions are gone. And we have a new one who doesn't know or doesn't care about what had happened. And so we find out very quickly that because of this, the Israelites are now in slavery and being treated so poorly. We find out a lot about Pharaoh very quickly as well. We're told in this passage that this is taking place in Egypt and that the slaves are being used to build, build cities, uh, build supply cities in, in Egypt, the cities of Pathom and Ramesses, which we don't know exactly where they're at. We don't know exactly what they're at, but they would be in the northern section up in that green area uh, on the map being shown right now. Um, hopefully that's also showing up online. There we go. Um, which is actually lower Egypt. Upper Egypt is in the south and the lower Egypt is in the north. And you probably know why. It's because the Nile flows from south towards north. So Upper Egypt is where the, the Nile starts or where it first comes in, and then Lower Egypt is where it continues on to. And so this is taking place up in this green area up, up in the north. Carl, are you showing that on? I'm not seeing that on the Facebook stream. Awesome. Uh, so it's probably up there near Tanis and Busiris and Avaris. Up in that area is where these places are, are, are the, where these two places are, these two cities, these supply cities, these storage cities. The slaves, the slaves did not build the pyramids. The pyramids were there long before these slaves came along. And contrary to what Ben Carson said, they, the, two, the pyramids were never used to store grain. You folks probably know what the pyramids actually were, right? Tombs. Tombs. Tombs for, for kings and royalty, especially the big ones. In fact, the day a king became king, if not before, is when they started construction on his tomb. Because it took that long to build something so grand. Even these other places, this is uh, Luxor and Karnak, the temples in Luxor and Karnak, as well as the big cat is the Sphinx. Yeah, there we go. All right? Now, you might not know, since they're called temples, we might think that those are gods. Those are actually kings, other pharaohs from prior generations, from prior empires. That's who those people are. They're big, they're important people. Even uh, the Sphinx, the head of the Sphinx, it was a pharaoh. Uh, Kofni, I believe, was, was his name. And that's, that's who that is. Because they're kind of a big, they're, they're big. The, the, the Pharaoh is the most important and most powerful per person in the world, or at least in the known world. Chariots and horses, chariots and horses that he had, they're not used for a nice Sunday afternoon drive through, ride through the country. They're not used by grandma only on Sundays to get back and forth to church. They're military weapons. They're the supersonic jet fighters of the day. So, Pharaoh is important. In fact, the Pharaoh is kind of like a giant cucumber. He's kind of a big dill. 
In fact, more than just kind of, he is a big deal. People think that he is a god or is becoming a god. Hence the shape of the pyramids to help usher them into the the next life, into the afterlife, to help them ascend. That's why pyramids are shaped the way they are. But this guy, this guy, well, it's, we, could, we could probably say he's crazy. <laughs> uh, and, and he's afraid. And he's pushing that fear. He's afraid of the Israelites. He's afraid of the Hebrews. Now, he uses two different words, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Well, more than a minute, a couple of minutes from now. But he's afraid of them. Now, falsely, he says, oh, they're so numerous. Were they? No. He says, oh, they're more numerous than us. Nope, don't believe that. He's exaggerating. What's he really worried about? He says it in that passage. What's he really worried about? That they will leave the land. He's afraid that they're going to lose their labor source, their free (laughs) labor source. That's what he's afraid of. And so he pushes fear, fear of the other, fear of the differences, fear of these people upon the rest of the populace, and he acts out of fear. It's a particular kind of fear that we have a word for. We have a word for everything, don't we? Xenophobia, fear of the other. So, The Pharaoh was xenophobic, and he was trying to make everybody else xenophobic, and he wanted them to act out of this fear. Pharaoh, I'm sure, wasn't the first person to be afraid of the other or to act in some sort of way like this. I'm sure that humanity has done that since the day we were born, since the day we were created, since the day we started walking on this planet being afraid of the other, nor was he the last. We go back about eight decades and look at Europe, and we see that that's exactly what the Nazis did. Promote fear of the other. So much so that we resulted in a war that was the worst one, worst loss of life ever upon this planet by war, correct? One, a fear, a fear that was pushed until it came up with the final solution and almost completely wiped out the other. Martin Niemöller was a German priest at the time, and he said this. He said, first they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. But 80 years ago wasn't the last time we've seen xenophobia. We only, only turned back two decades to our own nation. To following September 11th, 2001, and there was case after case of people, merely because they looked Arabic or Muslim, uh, being beat up, being stoned, having rocks thrown through building windows, just because they looked like they were the other. And still today, Politicians are pretty good at pushing fear of the other. You've probably seen commercials for for all those political ads, even if you tried not to see them. Do any of them actually say, vote for me because I can do this? Very, very, very few. There's probably some out there. The vast majority of them is, oh, you don't want to vote for them. They like it when we vote out of fear. But we aren't called to xenophobia. We aren't called to live out of fear. We are called to vilosenia. 
<laughs> Come to worship and you'll learn in Greek today, right? Take your notes. This will be on the final exam. Spoiler alert, no final exam. Philoxenia, which means love of the other. That's what we're called for, called to. We're not called to hate or to fear the other. We are called to love the other, called to love the other by God, by Jesus, by being followers of the risen Christ. It involves welcome. It involves hospitality. It involves care. It involves courage and compassion. Just like the midwives and the Egyptian princess. Shifra and Pua had courage. They are, as far as I've ever been able to tell and figure out and discern, they are the earliest recorded incidents of civil disobedience. <laughs> they stood up to power. They stood up to the powers that be. They stood up to xenophobia. And they stood up to what they knew was wrong and immoral in order to do what was right. They lied in order to make that happen, but you can't blame them, can you? <laughs> Their names were Shifra and Pua. What was the Pharaoh's name? He's not named. 3,000 years later, we know their names. We speak their names. While the Pharaoh's name has disappeared into the sands. The author is pointing out that they are more important than he. Do you want to be remembered? Offer love instead of hate. Offer courage instead of fear. Okay, the princess. <laughs> now, the princess was just kind of going about her day, doing the things that a princess does. This is presumably an ordinary, regular kind of day for her, and taking a day down to, the, down to the Nile to bathe, has her entourage with her, doing everything that they need to do to take care of her, anything that she wants, they do. But today is different. Today, something happens that completely upsets the apple cart, completely changes her pattern. Today, she sees a Hebrew child. And she has compassion. So there were two words used in this passage. Said so the Pharaoh used both of them earlier, and she just used one of them now. They, they use the words Israelite, and they also use the word Hebrew. A and without knowing, and just over time, they've come to mean the same things, right? And in, in fact, the language of the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. And so we think Hebrew and Israelite are the same. But not for the author of Exodus. They mean two entirely different things. Now, all Israelites were Hebrews, but not all Hebrews were Israelites. Because the Israelites were people who were direct descendants from Jacob and from his 12 sons. Those were Israelites. And they were slaves in Egypt. But not all Hebrews were descendants of the Israelites. Hebrews, in the book of Exodus, refers to anyone who is a slave, anyone who is in the lower class of the society, anyone who is looked down upon. It is not a good title, it's an epithet. Oh, they're just Hebrews. They're the other. That's what that word means in the book of Exodus. She recognizes, the princess recognizes the child as a Hebrew. She recognizes him as the other, from another ethnicity. 
from another class, from another status. And she displays compassion rather than fear. She does it in several ways. She does it by raising him out of water or having her, one of her attendants do that. By raising him into safety, pro by providing a nurse to care for him and feed him. And she raises him to a different level by naming him. Because the name she gives him is not a Hebrew name, nor is it an Israelite name. It is an Egyptian name. You know, in the text, which we didn't read today, it's, it's one of those ones you'd fill in a little bit after this happens. So uh, chapter 2, verses 7 through 11, 12. She names the child Moses. And the text says that, you know, she says, I'm going to name him that because I drew him out of the water. It doesn't mean that. Now, it sounds like a Hebrew word meaning draw out. But it's not what it is because it really is an Egyptian name. What does it mean? You have to wait a minute to find out. <clears throat> so in today's reading, we see Pharaoh who acts out of fear. We see the midwives who act out of courage. And we see the princess who acts out of compassion, in which do we see an emulation of God and how God acts? Certainly not in Pharaoh, for God does not act out of fear. God has nothing to fear. The Egyptians, the Egyptians might have seen Pharaoh as a small g God, <laughs> or seen a God, small g, in him, but we don't. And we know that big G God does not act out of fear. How about the midwives? Do the, Im do the midwives emulate God in any way? Well, perhaps. They act out of courage, not that God needs courage, But we can see in them an appreciation of God, a respect of God, and, a, and an identification of God. But how about the princess? Can we see an emulation of God in the princess? Yes, we can. For God does not act out of fear, but God does act out of compassion. So much so that God put on flesh and bone to be born, live, die, and be raised from the dead. God doesn't hate the other. God loves the other. And we need to thank God <laughs> that God loves the other because the other is us. Each of us is the other. We are Hebrews in the fullest sense of, of that term in the book of Exodus. And as the princess saves Moses from death in the water, God saves us from the death of sin. As the princess raises Moses into a new life, God raises us into the new life that only God can provide. And as the princess names Moses, so God calls us by name and gives us a new one. But it's not the name of Moses because it means something much different. You see, in Egyptian, the S-E-S -E part of a name, the S-E-S -E part of a name means son of. And so Moses is the son of Mo. And we're not talking three stooges here. He is the son of Mo. Well, what is Mo? Mo means no one. 
So when she names him Moses, it's because she has no idea who his parent is, who his father is. And he is the son of no one. But the name that God gives each of us, or the title that God gives to each of us, is child of God. Son of God. Daughter of God. And that's what you are. Through God's grace, we are saved. We are raised, and we are adopted into God's family. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we we give you thanks for this day and for all the ways you have blessed us already in this day, waking us up this morning, giving us another day, another opportunity to be in ministry and in mission to and for and with you. We thank you for the blessing of your presence here with us today. We thank you that we are able to be in this place merely because we want to be, not because someone told us we have to be. And so we give you thanks for the freedoms that we have here in this place, in this land. As we go about our days today and tomorrow, celebrating and remembering our independence, uh, we also pause and ask you to help remind us of our dependence upon you and upon each other as we we go through our lives. We ask that you will help us to live worthy of our freedoms and that we will live lives of courage and compassion rather than lives of fear. Now, Papa, because of your love, because of your grace, because you're here with us, You've heard things that we've shared, and you've read my notes. You've read texts and emails. So you know the things I'm going to say before I say them. You know our joy at Bob F., and that his eye surgery was successful this past week. And we give you thanks for for that, and we, we are filled with joy at the prognosis of returned eye health and vision. But, Papa, we ask for more because we know that there is a recovery process to take place. We know that his journey towards that does not end right away. And so we pray for that, and we pray for the the patience that it will take for him to have. We also have our concerns, and so we pray for Les B. As uh, he just finds out, just found out that he needs to have another surgery. We pray that it will be scheduled soon so that his issue can be taken care of. In the meantime, God, we do pray for some relief of of his pain. We do lift to you all the families who are experiencing grief this morning, and in particular, we mention the family of Robert Schropp. We pray that they will find, that they will Feel your presence with them and be comforted by that. We pray that they will see your light shining in their darkness. And, Papa, if there's a way that we can be that light, even if it's just a, can- a, a matchstick in a giant cavern, that you will give us the, the strength it needs to do that, and that you will help us see it as well. But our prayers go beyond just these and beyond the ones of the the folks who are on our prayer list. And we we lift to you ourselves because we have needs, but we, we haven't let them go across our lips. And so we pray to you for our healing so that we can be healthy and that we can be whole so that we can offer your healing powers and ministry to others. We pray for the communities of which we are a part. Help us to see them as the other, but not out of fear, but out of love. 
and help them to realize that that's what we want as well. We pray for this world that is so broken and hurting. We pray for the church universal that she can work together to bring glimpses of what your kingdom looks like. We do pray for the United Methodist Church, for our bishops, Bishop Morkoikoi and Bishop Steiner Ball, as they continue to lead us here in the Susquehanna Conference, along with their cabinet, including RDS, Kathy Boylu. We pray for not just the 10 churches on our circle of prayer, but for all the churches of the conference, especially those churches and clergy and families who are just beginning a new appointment and who perhaps are having their first worship experience together right at this time. We pray for those appointments to be successful. We pray for all churches that are beginning a new year under the same appointment as well. That in all things your name will be glorified and your kingdom expanded. We pray for the, the leaders of this world, the governments of this world. We lift to you the people of the Ukraine and the people of Russia. Our hearts ache for them both. We especially lift before you our President and Congress, the Senate and the House, and the Supreme Court, that they can find ways for peace and justice in our land. While we do pray for that time when swords will be beaten into plowshares and war will be learned no more, we continue to ask for your protection upon all those who keep us safe, the military at home and abroad. We do pray for all those involved in the all first responders, for police, for firefighters that rush in when others rush out, and for emergency medical personnel who come to our aid when we need it most. Lastly, God, we ask that you will send to us the folks that nobody else wants and the ones that think they won't be wanted by us. But rather than just sitting back and relaxing, that you'll prompt us to go to them as well, so that in each of these cases, we can show them signs of your love and your grace. We do lift all of these prayers to you in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Uh, one announcement that I was given just before we started worship this morning, um, and that is that the, uh, the, the Frayne Sunday School classroom, one of our Sunday School classrooms, adult classroom, is going to be starting a new, uh, a new study this coming week, and it's based on the, uh, the, the series The Chosen, and there'll be a Bible study that goes along with that, and they're opening it up to anyone that wants to join them for that, and they will be meeting downstairs, uh, and again, that begins next week, 9.30 is when their, their class starts on that. Now, we're able to do things like that and, and other things because of your financial faithfulness. So we, we do thank you for, for that as, as well. Of course, folks who are in person, uh, we do have the offering plates at the back of the sanctuary for your use. Folks at home, you can't do that. There is the PayPal QR code on the screen right now. Uh, if, if you wanted to, you can, go, you can go about it that way, and that's if you're at home or here. There's other ways to give if you want to check out our website for ways to give. Because of your financial faithfulness, yes, we pay our bills. We're also able to do amazing things and have those studies and have a very successful, uh, participate in a very successful VBS program. I don't know if pa Dave mentioned this last week, but there were 80 kids involved in the Vacation Bible School uh, that we participated in two weeks ago. Some of them were from our congregation. Some of them were from, our, from daycare, from Noah's Ark. Some of them were from the uh, Church of the Brethren. Some were from the Lutheran Church. And best part of all, some of them were from no, from no church at all. And so they were, in, they, in, they were able to encounter God and encounter Christ through that program, through the, the Vacation Bible School, and through your financial faithfulness. So we do thank you for that. Uh, we also are able to continue to support, in a lot of ways, different missions, including Waynesboro Community Human Services, which we just found out this past week uh, from Denise Esser, who, who is the executive director, that there are more homeless people in the Waynesboro area now than she can ever recall having at one time in the past. Don't know why. And they are in desperate need of, get this, water. 
something that I, I know I'm guilty of completely taking for granted. And we think that that should be simple. But we supplied them with a few cases of water this past week, and we're going to be doing that again in the future to help them stay supplied and, and keep those people hydrated and safe. But again, because of you, so thank you for that. Uh, and so now we will move on to a uh, service of Word and Table, and I'm going to head over there and uh, try not to get my feet wet in the Nile River. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. When Pharaoh ordered all the Hebrew boys to be murdered at birth, he was outwitted by the women. One gave birth to Moses, whom you then placed in Pharaoh's house. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this. In remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. Again, he gave you thanks, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. May we each do our part according to the grace given us. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, showing forth the fruit of the Spirit until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Would my helpers come forward? This is not my table. This is not the United Methodist Church's table. It's God's table where Christ is host and has place cards for all. What does that mean? That means you don't have to be a member of this church. You don't have to be a member of any church. But if you've felt God's grace and you want more, if you've tasted God's grace and you want more, then please come. Uh, we have bread, which uh, you can receive either from Donna or myself. Take and eat. Uh, then there's the cups take and drink, and then there are receptacles on the end of each aisle to place the empties. Uh, I do have the pre-filled, if you would prefer that, and I also have gluten-free wafers, if that's an issue. So please, come.
Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. My crinkly sand. No texts. Okay, no texts. So our song of parting, you know, there are a number of songs, uh, several in our hymnal, that, are, that have their traditions, their origins in the story of the Exodus, and this is one of them. We shall overcome. Please rise as you are able to do so, and let's join together in singing. Folks at home, sing along. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forever. Go in peace to love and serve God and neighbor in all that you do. Amen.